Everybody, you're very welcome to this uh, working session webinar, uh, where we're going to talk about some of the work with uh, historical data, data integration for, for that. Um, and um, first, just to introduce the people here. So we have Peter Peregrine um, from Lawrence University, also the chair of HREF, and he can talk a little bit in a moment about his work. We have Kevin Feeney, who is the um, CEO of Terminus DB, um, and um, also, uh, you know, a expert data modeler who's been in the depths of historical data modeling for a few years now, working on the early stages of SESHAT and modeling all the polities. We have uh, Chuck Ho, who is the uh, DevRel lead from Terminus DB. Um, and she's always out there talking to people about how you can use Python to better understand and analyze your data. So, uh, oh, wow. And we just have Gavin Mendel Gleason dropping in as well. Gavin is the CTO and database wizard um, of Terminus DB. And so he's the one that makes everything go and makes it the data not disappear out of the end of the bag. Yeah, it's, it's Gavin's fault. <laughs> <laughs> That's very important. Any performance <laughs> issues, it's Gavin's fault. Um, so, uh, really, I just wanted to kick off just by you know asking you, Peter, um, if you could introduce your work, uh, the project, and maybe talk a little bit about the sort of data challenges you face. Absolutely. So, um, I want to just start off giving a little overview of cross-cultural research, which is what I do. Um, and basically, cross-cultural research looks at a set of cultures, uh, usually a dozen to up to a hundred or, or more, to try and do two things. One of them is to understand or identify what the diversity is out there. So to ask how many societies have some particular behavior or some particular trait. But more importantly and more interestingly, to try and explain why those behaviors or traits exist. And in general, the answer has to do with some kind of adaptive uh, purpose that people behave in a given way because it helps them to survive in, in a social or political or economic situation. Um, Traditionally, cross-cultural research has been done in, in a sort of single historical time frame, and it's called the ethnographic present. Um, and that's largely because of the data that we have, that we have ethnographic data or archaeological data that, that exists kind of in one time. And one of the problems has been that because of that, we haven't been able to look over time very well to see if our explanations uh, actually work in, in terms of that what are presumed causes for some kind of behavior uh, actually precede their presumed uh, effects. And cross-cultural research has been around for about a hundred years, um, but this idea of trying to look over time has really developed only in about the past 25 years. Um, and there are a, a large number of serious issues that we have in terms of data for trying to look through time um, that relate to the problems that we have with just general cross-cultural data, but, but I think are much more significant. And it's taken a hundred years. Well, it, it took about 75, maybe up to 100 years to get cross-cultural research to the point where we had enough data to really start answering interesting questions. And we've been working on the, the through time data for about 25 years. It would be nice that that didn't take 100 years to get to the point where we could answer interesting questions. Um, and so one of the things that I'm hoping is that this whole process can speed that up and give us really quality data quickly. Um, so the issues that we primarily face in terms of data um, are, are one is an analysis, how, how we analyze the data. That's not really what we're talking about here, but it's a very interesting set of statistical problems. 
Second one has to do with actually coding the data, turning the information we have into some kind of analyzable form, which is another set of really interesting computer issues that AI may speed up. Um, but again, that's not here. The thing that's really uh, of importance here is attempting to get enough quality data to try and answer some of these questions. Uh, and, and there are a, a huge range of data sources out there, um, but they are so diverse. The metadata associated with them is so diverse. Uh, much of the data don't really have any easily searchable metadata. And what we're talking about range from, in a, in a traditional sense, ethnographies, um, and, and those are in publications or books, but also in manuscript form. And then photographs, artifacts. When we start trying to do that over time, then we have all sorts of historical documents, historical books, but also a huge range of archival material, a huge range of, of archeological material. So it just exponentially increases this issue of how do we access data that we can use to answer interesting questions. Um, there has been a number of attempts to systematize those data. Uh, one that I have been affiliated with, although I haven't been working directly with, is Seshat, which is a, a, a group that is trying to pull together um, historical data uh, in a systematic way and in a way that can continuously integrate new data. Um, I think you're going to show some of that today and talk about some of that. The specific project I've been working on has been to look um, through time at societies that ha have experienced catastrophes to try and, and examine what, what the conditions were before the catastrophe and what the conditions were afterwards to try and understand why some societies were affected more and others were not. Specifically, what I've been working on over the past three years is one ca catastrophe, which is an event that took place in 536 um, that was probably a massive volcanic eruption. And then two following volcanic eruptions, one in 540 and one in 541. And the effect of those was essentially to block the sun. They sent huge amounts of ash into the air. Um, and it looks like global temperature dropped about a degree and a half Celsius in a year. Uh, and that continued along with a, a fairly significant diminishment of sunlight for at least 10 years. And it created what has come to be known as the late antique Little Ice Age um, and that time period has been suggested as what or those atmospheric conditions as one of the reasons why the Roman, the Western Roman Empire collapsed. Um, it has been suggested as that's the beginning of the plague of Justinian, that it had dramatic effects across Eurasia. Um, looking at North America, that is a time of a great cultural fluorescence in North America, a time of uh, potentially significant collapses in Mesoamerica. So this has been suggested to have worldwide consequences, at least in the Northern Hemisphere. And what I've been looking at is to try and understand why some societies especially in far Northern Europe, like uh, in Denmark, Scandinavia, did very well and expanded. This is the time when the Vikings uh, began to sort of ramp up uh, or, or what we call today the Vikings. Um, and it's also a time, as I said, in North America where some of the, the great civilizations of North America began to ramp up. Whereas in other places like the Roman Empire, it looks like it was the beginning of the end. So I've been trying to understand that. And the data for looking at that are diverse, difficult to access. And, and so I think one of the things we're going to talk about today, if I, if I understand what's happening, is um, how we might 
expand those data to answer some interesting questions. And I think the ones that I put forward, I don't know if that's what's going to be focused on, is trying to gather better data about military conflicts, which seem to be one of the things that increased after this event, and about um, epidemic disease, like the plague of Justinian. But it looks like there are other uh, epidemic diseases, uh, for example, in Ireland, where 541, 542, the Irish Chronicles suggest that there was a, a big uh, famine and a, a, some kind of epidemic disease going through the island. So that's what I'm interested in. Uh, and I'll turn it back to you, Luke. That's very interesting. Thanks a lot for that, Peter. Um, I mean, poor old, poor old Justinian, he's just about to snatch back the Western Roman Empire. Um, and it all gets taken from his fingertips yep. through no fault of his own. And what we remember him for primarily is a plague. Uh -huh. <laughs> after, after all his hard work, that's what it comes down to. And now everybody says that Basil II was the best uh, emperor of the Byzantines, which to me seems totally unreasonable. It should be just in. <laughs> it wasn't his fault that the, the long winter came and the, uh, no. and, and the plague came in his name. So, you know, is the object then to try and kind of use that sort of research to then do some sort of projection onto, you know, future events around climate change, around climate yeah. emergencies, to better understand that sort of events and the kind of impacts that might have on, on current and future societies? That's exactly right. Exactly right. In fact, the, the research I did over the past three years was funded by the Department of Defense uh, as a model for nuclear winter. So, wow. yeah, so it, that, there, there's um, very clear contemporary applications for, for trying to understand what was going on in the past. Okay, okay, interesting. Uh, yeah. So, Kevin, do you want to come there and maybe just talk about some of the kind of data challenges and, you know. Yeah, sort of absolutely. Like, I'll, come, I'll kind of describe some of the challenges from then a data modeling and curation point of view. You know, which, which is is really. But before that, like just to emphasize the significance of this type of work, we're obviously going through a global pandemic at the moment. Okay, these things uh, at the historic, uh, at, you know, if you go back five thousand years, there's they've happened many, many times. Uh, groups of you know uh, of societies tend to act in pretty similar ways to uh, to to crises over the years. It's very difficult for people to currently uh, um, you know, get their hands on good data about what happened in the past. It's people like Peter, and they have to scratch through you know, library books and you know, libraries by hand uh, to try and accumulate this data. Now, Peter has, has brought together you know, a really high quality expert curated uh, data set on 23 different societies, reasonably small societies, but he studied in detail. But what we'd love to be able to do is you know, see how those, you know, the observations from those type of, you know, uh, very well curated. How did they scale up to broader societies? Because we know there's uh, other historical data sets out there. DBpedia, obviously, th this is in, in the DBpedia hackathon, but there's lots and lots of information about historical conflicts in DBpedia. Uh, how, yeah, do we get, how do we get at that and use that to, you know, prove or disprove what we see in these, in these small case studies? Because because this is the best guide that we have as humanity to what is the best way through pandemics. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point, that one, because I mean, you know, from the current pandemic circumstances, all we ever really talk about is 1918. Yeah. There's no broader reference material as to, you know, what were successful strategies for societies <laughs> prior to that. And it's just 1918 and nothing else really, maybe a little bit of the 1950s, um, but 1918 seems to be the primary reference point. So there is no, hey, let me go look at this large database, data set, to try and do some sort of broad analysis to see what might be suitable strategies for us to adopt on a broad level to address these sorts of challenges. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, with data and with uh, weight of numbers, you know, a lot of things become obvious that certain things will work and certain things will not. And, and it's very valuable that we know the, uh, the learnings from history, that we don't have to remake these mistakes again and again. 
Anyway, so, so, so that's kind of the, the significance out of the way. Uh, and as I say, I, I really, I think a lot of people underestimate the value that we can draw from human social history. Like we're not that special or different than humans were in the past. We tend to react to situations in similar types of ways, particularly in groups. It's really very valuable uh, uh, to society to, to, to help people, you know, extract uh, historical data in, in such a way that we can do these type of analytics. Uh, but having said that, like then we come to the challenges, and Peter's alluded to a lot of them, you know. But, but the first thing that we get from a, a data modeling point of view is everything is uncertain. So, and the ground can always shift. People can come out with a new study which reinterprets the way that you know people interpret a whole society. So everything can change. This is very important. The uh, relative waste that we put on different sources can change over time. People can become discredited or, or whatever. Uh, and, this, uh, and this happens within the social sciences through a social network. It's, it's, rarely, it's rarely kind of explicitly stated that, oh, nobody reads that person anymore. It's kind of social knowledge. There's a huge, huge amount of knowledge as to how we interpret the data, even the published data that's embedded in these social networks. And to really be able to analyze and curate this data, we have to bring all of this information out. We need to know where the sources of information came from. We need to know the relative certainty of the data. And we need to be able to capture that in the data. We can't just you know, do a statistical squashing because to do valid uh, statistical analysis on this, you have to carry the uncertainty with you. You, know, you need to use statistical techniques that, that are robust against uncertainty ranges and so on to do any type of valid analysis in the end. So, so you've got a, a very large challenge then. And when it comes to data modeling, it means, you know, it simply means every single data point has to be scoped with certainty. Every single data point has to be scoped, not just with a date point or, uh, and a geographical point, but with a range, because oftentimes you, you have an uncertain range as to what the, t what the timing or or you know, uh, different archaeological techniques will give you different uncertainty ranges as to when a artifact was deposited, for example. Uh, you also then, you, you need, like, you can only, re it would almost be impossible to do this type of data modeling if, it, if you didn't have knowledge graph technology, because there'd be too many tables, there'd be too many joins, it's too messy, there's too many different types of data. When you're trying to kind of understand meta dynamics in societies, you're, try, you're trying to capture things to do with their religious functions, uh, things to do with their internal social stratification, uh, things to do with their beliefs. All of these things can be important, you know, and uh, you, need to, you, need to, so you need a very rich modeling language to be able to capture all of these things at the same time. Other things that are also very important, like granularity of time is, is a, and granularity of units is, the, is one of the things that makes it the most difficult to integrate data sets that, that have been collected from different parts. Because when people are doing archeological digs, they document each little fragment of pottery and that's what the database looks like. And, uh, and so to go from that to, uh, you, uh, and actually all of this data matters because the overview of the aggregate of that data tells you something about the social structure of that society. But, but the person who's collected that data cares about documenting the site. Uh, they don't necessarily care about like how that can be aggregated together or that's not their concern. So you have to uh, ca capture all of those concerns in your, in your data modeling challenges. You need great variety. You have to be able to add properties that are, uh, you know, from very different places. You have to be able to have properties uh, that talk about things in different granularity that you can summarize uh, to make them in intercomparable between different societies. Because as Peter said, you're, it's, it's, it's an even more uh, daunting uh, data challenge than, than uh, just intercultural, uh, you know, you're, because you're trying to come up with ways uh, of describing these societies in such a way that you can compare today's society meaningfully with, you know, a society from 12,000 years ago who just started farming and say, well, where do they differ, you know? What are the fundamental differences and why? And so, so it's um, and and so the, the data modeling aspect and you know the the need for uh, technology knowledge graph technology that can capture that and curate it is just critical because because you cannot uh, sacrifice any of that uncertainty data any 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 of or any of the complexity of the data or the references to the data it's all part of the critical uh, uh, data that you need to curate. 
And then the other thing that is also massively important, and I'll show, kind of with, talk through some examples and show some of these things, is versioning, uh, versioning and branching of the data. And this is particularly actually important because none of these data sets are like one-off shots. People want to be able to improve them over time. They want to be able to kind of even improve the data models. They get better ideas as they go along. But not just that, like a lot of academic research has got like funding uh, is funded for a particular purpose, okay? And, so, and you need to collect a set of data according to some model, maybe do some prototyping on that. Are we collecting the right type of data? Because until you do the first analysis, it's not always clear. Uh, and do that in a kind of protected way and, and eventually publish it when you're ready, you know? And these, so you need actually long running branching of the data that might last, you know, 18 months. And that's in, the data is embargoed, but also the data model is in transition. But it turns out like, to actually do that effectively, you have to merge data repeatedly back from the main data collection because to do the analysis, to see if you're collecting the right data, you, you need the original data and that keeps on changing. And, and, you, and also, you know, people have particular, they publish versions and they, they want to say, okay, and they want to reference them. So it's really important that you, you, can, you can also draw a line in the sand and say, well, this is the SESHAS data, or this is the resilience data that was published to support this article in this magazine. Because then the next challenge, you know, and these are the, you know, very interesting challenges. These are a lot of the challenges that drove the requirements of Terminus TV, because we've been working with Peter and, uh, and, the, and some of the SESHAS people and other social scientists people for a long time. So, but, but, uh, and so we kind of saw the real urgent need for a lot of the features uh, for a lot of the features we have like branching and merging and the strong schema support that you could bring a model with the data but but the other thing that's very interesting and kind of unusual for data people uh, about this data is it's highly scrutinized much more highly scrutinized than you know any data points uh, most people ever produce because when you produce you know um, theoretical or answers to theoretical important social theoretical questions that are backed up by huge amounts of data you're stepping on a lot of people's toes always there's a lot of professors who've built careers on the opposite uh, and, and people are coming in and they're only you know peter is a uh, is is on the cutting edge of social science research he uses a lot of data many uh, of the uh, of the establishment in in you know the people who hold professorial seats do not are not comfortable with data and react badly against it and so you can it's very easy to uh, uh to make yourself look bad by publishing a single you know stupid piece of stupid data points you know people that, will that, sorry <laughs> that does seem to be a real theme around a lot of the criticism that some of this work has seen and peter i don't know if you want to comment that you know there's a kind of a, a view of a historian as an artisan of somebody that um, you know, individual interpretation is the real key, and it's all about my analysis of a. Uh, I'm pulling out a thread, a thread, a narrative from history that you know feels appropriate, rather than any of these more, you know, systematic approaches. That's very true, and and it is a, a deep and difficult problem in the field. Um, in cross-cultural research, what we try and do is have very low inference um, coding, so present or absent, or um, some, none, much. But for a lot of very interesting questions, that's not the case. You need high inference coding, you, and, and that's where the historians will say that a scholar A may say this, but they don't know what they're talking about. And I'm scholar B, I say this is going on. And th that is a serious problem, yeah. And, and if we can find a solution to that, uh, the field could be transformed. That's, uh, that's a very, <laughs> that's a, a, a goal that may not be obtainable. And that's kind of a function of the sparsity of the data in some cases, I suppose. Because when there's kind of no data there, you have to make those sorts of inferences or or deductions rather than necessarily having a big, like here's what happened piece by piece. Oh, absolutely. And um, there's a, a question or, or an issue that may be related that came out of biology. And um, it was, it's traditionally called the mouse from Michigan problem. Um, because according to 
I don't remember who this was, um, but they would put forward an argument and there would always be somebody in the audience who would say, yes, but there's a mouse from Michigan that doesn't behave that way, as if that <laughs> destroys the whole argument. And, and that actually is a very common and accepted form of argumentation in some of this work that if, if you understand statistics doesn't make any sense. And mm. if we can get a handle on the quality of the data, that creates a, a counter argument itself. Yeah, so I think that's a great point. Issues there. And I think that's like really one of the things that we're trying to achieve with, with Terminus TV and Terminus Hub is just providing much easier access for people to that data and then make it easier for them to ask questions of it so that they can then empower themselves to become, you know, data driven in their own right in a very easy way because it, it's a high bar for participation at the moment. I mean, you know, it has never been a traditional part of the historical formation that you'd learn Python or you'd learn R. Um, you know, that's just not there in a way that it has come into other, you know, softer science pieces like economics, obviously it's more numbers driven, but not so much. Gavin, just to bring you in uh, before we flip over to Kevin talking about some of the, uh, the, the naughtier data challenges, I don't know if you had any comments about um, some of those things that Kevin was talking about, about, you know, encoding uncertainty into the database and, uh, and that sort of work from your, from your experience in the, in, the, in the belly of the beast. Right, well, in, in, in terms of that, uh, actually Terminus is just sort of designed so that you can have a very flexible modeling and schema, and most of that happens at, the, at a higher level. So most of that would be stuff. So Kevin is really the expert on, on the data modeling aspect. And uh, we try to make it as convenient as possible to do that and then and just allow the modelers to create very rich models that reflect the way that they would like to code the data as best as possible. Perfect. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're kind of getting along. So maybe we'll hand over to you now, Kevin, and you could maybe share your screen and- Yeah, uh, uh, fantastic. Take a look of, at some of the data there start to kind of get into the, the guts of, of what this is all about. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, uh, so I'm sharing my screen now. I, I, so uh, I'm logged into uh, Terminus and, and Terminus Hub. The first thing to get here is- uh, Just, just yeah. before you begin there, I just, yeah. just on Terminus and Terminus Hub, the Terminus DB for anybody that is new to this particular piece of software, it, it's open source. It'll always be open source. It's really, uh, we, we, we're great believers in open source and help open source movement. So. We wanted to provide a platform for people that are researchers to build these sorts of knowledge graphs. And then Terminus Hub, which is the collaborative layer, is um, you know, a, a freemium thing. So anybody that's doing anything public interest can know that they can do it for free forever because that's what we're here to facilitate. Exactly. So anybody can log in and, and click on the clone button and these, these resources are available to everybody. The, the SESHA uh, Global History Data Bank is there. The DBpedia, uh, the entire collection of DBpedia facts is there, uh, which are the things we're going to be talking about now. I've also, you can actually, if you type in here, if you type Kevin, I've started to add some extra historical resources that, uh, that I have created myself. So including here we have the Pleiades uh, database, which is a gazette of uh, historical facts that is also available. Uh, so. So, so we do have a lot of the resources and stuff that we're showing you and also uh, as I'm going to show you we're, we're going to go into uh, the specific data set we're working on with Peter and the data we're going to look closely at the data model of that uh, but, but just to let people know there are all of the resources that we talk about you can just log into Terminus TV download yourself and you get exactly the same databases as we have here so the so the first one, I think, uh, we'll just uh, look at because one of the themes of the of the DBpedia hackathon is, you know, obviously DBpedia and DBpedia. For those who don't know, it, it's it's basically all the facts extracted from the boxes within Wikipedia, uh, extracted in such a way that we can query them. So if, if you see here, you can download and clone this. This is quite a large data set. It comes down at 627 megabytes. It starts off at about 10 gigabytes. In Terminus TV, we compress everything. One of the big parts of allowing this cloning of databases 
uh, essentially is, is to make it as fast as possible. This has got about 45 million triples, million basically logical facts in it. And one of DBpedia, this is all a single graph. There's no kind of particular schema to this because because DB, B, DBpedia is what we would say is semi-structured. It does have class structure and stuff like that, but it also has lots of kind of freely added triples. We can just do a query into this. We can kind of do a limit hundred dot all, and that will just give us the first hundred assertions in DBpedia. Uh, and the, the kind of exciting thing to get here is that these type of queries come in at less than a hundred milliseconds, and you can and you're querying over forty-five million triples. So one of the things Terminus gives you that, that's often difficult is okay, I can get at all of these this data within DB, within Wikipedia, but it, it's it's often slow. So, so this allows you to to do like arbitrary queries across DBpedia very very fast. And we'll we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that we we might find in there. Uh, you know, to support Peter's work, which is really saying, okay, how do we find information about conflicts and societies from that time slice from the from the sixth century that we can add together into Peter's data with Peter's data to to see if if the results that we get from the studies of the sm small societies do they scale to, to you know uh, global scales, and that is information that we should be able to find. It's in DBpedia in some form or another. Also, the Pleiades data set is a data set. Of historical gazettes, and it will also have uh, various information that that is very relevant to answering that question. Uh, information about historical sites that existed in that same time period. Okay, so 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 all of these databases are are can be uh, like we have pre-built them and cloned them now. But I'm going to do talk here a little bit about the Seshat data. Uh, the, Global Historical Data Bank before we uh, talk about Peter's specific uh, database because I'm going to talk about how we integrate them because we're working on integrating that on, on uh, uh, taking all the historical data that's relevant from Seshat, integrating with Peter's uh, work on resilience in the sixth century uh, to again uh, to, to allow us to answer you know more questions with greater certainty. But, but to explain uh, how this data is organized, so one of, as I say, the really big challenges in uh, curation of social science data is managing versions. Because people, the, the data, the structures change over time, the questions people change, uh, change over time, the, the funding bodies change over time, and so on. And so the first thing you need to do is be able to manage which version you're working on and what, which piece of data is there. So in Ter Terminus DB, we can do this through uh, branches. So this is the, the main Seshat uh, data bank that is collected here. It's got a single graph. It is basically all the triples that were collected up until 2018 as part of the Seshat project and published in 2018 to support a paper in Nature. And, we, uh, and this basically is, is the raw material. This is what we are doing as part of the publication of Peter's work and, and the other historical work is basically building out a structure incrementally, adding uh, more and more structure to these published data sets and creating a higher and higher quality integrated database as we go along. So if I just do all of this, I can just do a limit 100.all to, to kind of peek into the database to see what's in there. We've got various things with lifespans and start and end. We can see kind of these are the year ranges of things. We've got a thing called a, a Seshat policy. Let's look a little bit deeper into that. We can say, well, show me all, I'm just doing, we should have some uh, good, reasonable documentation now that, that will teach people how to use uh, the query language. The query language is basically directly querying in, in a simple uh, JavaScript type of form. So we can say, I, I want variables that are uh, less uh, policy equals bars, uh, policy. So just declaring, I want to. I want to declare a variable here called policy, and I want. It's going to basically. I'm going to identify it by it having a type, seshat, policy. Okay. So this will tell. Will, will just give me a list. Whoops. Or did that not go wrong? No policy. Type. Policy. My last one. You on branch main now? Oh, I am on branch main. I think. 
this is a uh, let's just write polity in here for a sec and then I'll just put a type I can just next the type uh, and let me add a new variable to this called type so I can see what I'm doing where I'm going to make a mistake okay so, so this is just going to get me all everything and its type in the database uh, hopefully if it works yeah here we go so we have uh, such a policies uh, for example this is the identity of a policy it's a, a slightly strange IRI I don't know how that got in this was how the original data was all dumped but uh, so I can ask then anything about this specific policy so I am then going to say rather than type I'm going to change this thing to property so tell me all the properties of this specific, uh, and I don't need, uh, so I need, well, I can leave that there. Uh, property there. Property and object. An object, yeah, let's put that as object. So what I want to get out now is an object of this property. So really what I'm just showing is like, this is typically when we get a new RDF data set in, when you, you can add an RDF data set pretty easily to the system. But the first thing you need to do is kind of explore to find what types of things in there and what things hang off them. And this is a, a property, an object. So I'm just saying, okay, this specific quality that I found, tell me all of, of it. Did that not work? What is happening with that? Uh, I have to tell it's an IRI explicitly because it's got a funny thing. No. Uh, uh, the screen is slightly too small. I think if the it could be bigger. <laughs> okay, be so great. I'm going to try and, and increase the size there. Um, how, does anyone know how I actually do that in this? Uh, in the... <clears throat> the subject shouldn't have to be an IRI. It should be automatic there. Uh -huh. I think, I'm not sure. I think, yeah, anyway. Okay, so, so, so I'm going to come back to this in a minute because this is really the unstructured data and I, that we have already imported. We'll figure out what's going on there in a moment. So, so our, our, our basically now what I've done is I've changed the branch, okay? And now what we have in the structured branch that you find, this has actually got a, a proper ontology and a proper uh, schema factored out. And so what we've done here is we, we've got all the various classes that we're interested in. Uh, we will have classes here called uh, things like policy, I'm sure. Where is the policy? Uh, these are, as you can see, we've got like quite a complicated set of uh, data types uh, that we have defined because it's quite a complicated or qu quite a rich uh, data model. Okay, here we've got the interesting ones coming up. We've got things like battles defined in here, buildings, bureaucratic systems, cities, and so on. Okay, and so once we have a schema, we, we can actually do a different type of query. I wonder if I can, let me just stop sharing my screen for a second, see if I can share just this screen. If this, is that better in terms of scale? Yeah. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so, so I can do things like uh, uh, all or star schema. Okay, to, to uh, limit hundreds. So just, this will just get me the first hundred things that it finds in the schema. Okay, in fact, that's not that useful. But, but it, the, uh, now that I have a schema, I can automatically get lists of all the different properties that, that are in play, that are, are defined in, in the data set. And again, this is a very, quite a complicated one. We've got uh, things to do with language, lifespan of, uh, there's a lot of information, a lot of things that we need to add to the schema to allow us to scope uh, information properly. Okay, but we can also then to start, uh, we can start querying it. So we can say, um, uh, all the polity type, uh, policy. let's see if this one will work. No. Let me have a look for a sec. I think, okay, I think I'm gonna have to use this guy. I think that might not be picking up the prefix property, Gavin. 
sorry about this. Uh, all, uh, and let's see if that works. This, this is the, um, the, the, the reality of this type of data work though, you know, <laughs> quite explorative and, uh, they try to find exactly what you're looking for within, you know, messy data sets. Exactly. Uh, and uh, this is a data set that, that is less messy because it does have a schema. Uh, uh, in fact, oh, sorry, I know what I'm doing wrong. I have to write schema in this one because we have to, because it has a schema, we have to explicitly put as for it in the schema. Uh, why is it not picking that up? No, the type should actually be in the instance data. Oh yeah, you're right, sorry, so, so that shouldn't be in there, yeah. I'm just wondering if there's something wrong with our prefix matching our analyzer. This data set. Oh no, there we go. So, so, so these are all the things of typology, okay? Is it, uh, sorry, I, there's something that didn't give there, so I just want to figure out what that was. You should be able to match, all of these things are, are defined by full URLs under the hood, but you should be able to match them using this prefix. So something has happened there, but that prefix is not taken. Or do we even have that prefix? We do have Sasha prefix in there. Anyway, leave that to us. Uh, the, one of the things that's really complicated in the revision control is pushing the correct prefixes around. So we just have to fix that, Gavin, that uh, the Sasha prefix isn't working in that query. Okay. In any case, uh, back back to the to the kind of exploring of the data. So, so that structured data is basically a structured version of the of the main data set that we created. Now, when we created that data set back in 2018, we had much greater uh, kind of technical limitations than we have today. So we had to divide a lot of the data into three different sets: annotations and provi provenance and actual data. But now. Uh, we've arrived at a, at a situation where we have a, a much, we have none of those technical limitations anymore. So, so to make it easier to query all this data, we've united it all into a single, much more simple data model. Okay, and this is, this is uh, called V2. And so this is the kind of, this is the most up-to-date uh, collection of data and, and in, uh, of data and schema that we have that has the kind of, the most simple improved data model and also has all of the uh, all of the data all of the uh, publicly available data preloaded into it so this is the real kind of place where, where, where we can find the good uh, or which we are using as the as the basis for integrating other data bases into that and so to, sh to just show some uh, some of the stuff that we can do in here we can kind of say let me i want to guess uh, v a uh, predecessor Uh, VB. So th what this will, will give me one of the um, one of the uh, properties that is encoded in Seshat is wh which societies kind of emerge from which other societies, and this through the predecessor and su successor link. So this query will just give me a list of every the ID of every uh, data of every polity in the database, and then the ID of its of its uh, predecessor. Uh, so. Uh, and we can actually, rather than getting the IDs, we might want the names to pull that out. We can just do triple VA label, uh, VA label. And then the same for B. So, and in fact, we want, we want to call that uh, policy. No, sorry. Uh, yeah, we're gonna call that policy name. And then we'll call the other one policy predecessor. And this goes from VB. So basically we want to pull out the names of the polities and, and just see what they're called. So here we can see Girani Empire has his predecessor and so on. So this will give us a kind of a timeline. Just this simple query will give us a timeline through all of the evolution of who evolved from who according to the Sasha data set for all of the hundreds of uh, or there's 250, uh, two policies in, the, in this uh, chunk of data uh, that is encoded as having a specific uh, predecessor. And then we can, we can actually just put a select around that to say I'm only actually interested in the policy name and its predecessor to get a tidy little list that will tell us uh, which societies evolved from which other societies through, through history. Okay, and then, you know, we can extend those queries to add whatever other properties we're interested in and looking at from those uh, specific, uh, specific uh, societies. 
And so quite, quite readily then we can kind of build up single queries that look at the evolution of any specific property through time. Okay, and so there we go. That's our table of who preceded who. And onto any of those, we can then start to add, you know, uh, some of the uh, actual meaningful uh, values in the data into those uh, into those property into uh, onto those queries, and then we can start to see in, in very short amount of time things like the temporal evolution of, of different uh, of different attributes through society. Okay, so. So that's kind of a background to some of the data resources that are kind of published on Germanus uh, DB. Now I'm just going to do a little bit of a deep dive into the resilience data with Peter uh, and kind of talk people through some of the uh, data modeling uh, parts of that. Uh, but, but, but before I get into that, maybe it's a good time, Luke, to, to get any questions. Yeah, um, we haven't really have any questions coming in yet. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them as we go along or any comments about anything. Um, Carol was, uh, was uh, talking about how coders asking to rate the data quality and degree of inference. But that was in relation to the earlier conversation around, yeah. you know, people uh, questioning whether uh, outputs are correct. But maybe you could speak to that as you go through some of this. Um, and just talk about you know uh, data quality and, and and inference. Yeah. So, so so really, from our point of view, okay, like we, it's difficult for us uh, uh, on the technical level to 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 you know say much about uh, the data quality. And the reality is, like, what what data quality means varies quite a lot. Um, uh, over uh, uh, depending on you know what you're after so, so on the granularity of what you're interested in so for example if you're if you're if you're trying to answer a question on um, on you know the presence or absence of military conflict in a historical period uh, and you're inferring that from um, um, for, and, and you're Inferring that from yeah, um, inferring that from a query from DBpedia, the the reality is the the quality there is that you, you're probably going to get a lot of, of false negatives because you probably you may have a lot of missing data. So so, so it, from our point of view, like when you're integrating data, it, it's like for a purpose, and uh, and sometimes like aggregate qu queries across big data sets can be you know they will produce an answer for your specific uh, problem that is high or low, which is fine for a lot of cases, you know? So, it, so, so like, it's the, the interpretation of the quality of the source it has to be, like, done by the person who is actually producing the, the, the analysis at the end, because they're the ones who understand, well, what granularity they need, how sensitive their world is, and, and which sources that they want to actually, you know, that they want to trust or not. Uh, so, so, so what you want to be able to do is, rather than having a global view on, you know, on, on the reliability of, of data, uh, which is just very difficult to do because people have different opinions, you want to give people the tool that they can pull in data and, and tag it themselves and say, well, this came from there, so I'm going to consider this to have quite a low, uh, a low confidence level. Really, yeah. you know, the, the thing I've learned most in the world is, trying to integrate everything to exactly the same model from the top is, is impossibly difficult. What you want to do is uh, give people the, the ability to build their own curated parts of the world where they can interpret their sources, uh, you know, for the purpose of the analysis that they're interested in. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, uh, I think that makes real sense. So I think like basically there's a lot of information to take on board. So it'd be good to get into um, some of the, the data there. And I think Gavin, Gavin, if, if you don't mind doing that with all panels and these rather than just panels, that'd be great. Um, just because mm -hmm. I had a couple of uh, yeah. there that he was sharing um, that might work on some of the things that you're trying to do. So, so, so yes, yeah, so, so Gavin gave me the one for V2, which will, uh, where, where, hang on, I've lost it. it it's, in the, it's in the chat for this as well. Okay. You open Sorry. the chat on the, on the webinar or 
I'm struggling to find where the chat is in the webinar. Yeah, <laughs> there's too many things at the same yeah, time. You have to click on the chat button there. Uh, Q, is it the Q&A? Yeah, this is I the, yeah. This and is the Q&A the, uh, as well, yeah. Okay, I don't, I can only see the Q&A. I can't actually see any chat, sorry guys. Okay. There should be, uh, there should be another button too across from it called chat if you click on it. So we have actually got a question while you're doing that. Yeah. Maybe it's a good one for Gavin to talk to. And it's uh, given that Wackel is RDF triple compliant, you plan to include an interface for Sparklify Wackel queries. Uh, yeah. that's, that's for Gavin for, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Python based APIs and how do you specify named graphs with Wackel? Right. Okay, so we have, um, so we did actually initially have a Sparkle endpoint for things and uh, we just found it a little bit awkward and not very composable. So um, our, our, the, the main way that people talk to it is either through the J JavaScript API or through the Python API. It gives you an API resource which you can use to, to do your own queries. And it's uh, more composable and it's, it composes JSON-LD that's in the center of the wire. It's a bit more convenient to work with. Um, in terms of the uh, named graphs, uh, so we have a, uh, all of our uh, graphs, databases, branches, et cetera, are referenceable by um, a specific resource identifier. And those are documented in the ThermosDB documentation, but the, it's uh, more flexible than just having a graph name. You can specify down to the graph uh, name itself but usually what you want is a combination of a uh, instance graph and its associated schema. So most queries happen at the data, at the branch level. So a branch is sort of the, the basic um, thing that you usually talk to. And so we have, it, it, you can specify database and then that assumes that you're on branch main. You can sp specify database, repository, branch, and then graph. So you can, you can have the whole thing uh, and, and you specify that down to that granularity. Uh, Gavin, do you have any notebook you could maybe show a little bit of how the Python client works? So, because I guess there are people here interested in using Python. Absolutely. So hang on a second. So, uh, just, just while you're drinking it out, Gavin, Gavin sent in a few of the queries that are kind of pre-can queries that, that will give you the kind of starter into, uh, or can give people the starters into. We'll share all of these uh, through the Discord channel and other uh, means. But this is the kind of to get the meta structure of the Sashat database, this is this query will give you all the polities, what year they ended, what year they started in. That's the kind of meta historical structure. And you can see that these are integers. We've got the Greco bacterian uh, kingdom there from 0256 and so on. So that's like in terms of kind of try, that's the uh, meta structure for the Sashat database. Then the other one that Gavin just gave me is the uh, DBpedia query. Um, I lost that again. Bloody, bloody Zoom. <laughs> yeah, I had it. Half, I figured out how to get it, and then it went ahead itself again. And you know, uh, anyway, sorry, Gavin. So maybe you can share your screen and just show uh, show some of those uh, um, the uh, Jupyter Notebook interface. Eh? Yeah, I don't have. I think um, just to mention on the, on the Sparkle piece. Um, like we're open source, you know, and we're always interested in people building things in and around the database. So, you know, if, if the level of interest is enough, you know, I think we'd be, we'd be very open to working with people towards building, you know, uh, cool new uh, endpoints and things like that. Yeah, it shouldn't be hard to compile Sparkle into, into our world either. It's not very complicated. So um, I've shared my screen there uh, that just has a Python um, script that shows sort of the connection uh, to um, DBpedia. So this is actually a DBpedia test, but if you replace this with DBpedia and you do a clone of a DBpedia resource, you can talk to it using this. Uh, the connection, it just takes a number of different keys uh, to the client connection. And then once you're, you've done that, you can then interact with it uh, interactively. And here's an example of um, uh, one of the identifiers for a rebase. So you see you can specify the user, the database, and then local branch and then branch name. So you can get down to, to that level of granularity for named graphs. So uh, the, the um, 
let me just uh, start up a uh, so if you want to use it you know you can you can just uh, connect to it in the following way and it'll come back uh, with the success object that tells you yes indeed you're connected and then subsequently uh, you can just uh, query the database system using that connector so you can make up a uh, Walker query. So what did I call it? I called it WQ, sorry. Um, and then Yeah. So it's very uh, close to the original, yeah. Right. Yeah, I would also like to say that like some of these example scripts actually are on our tutorial repo. So if you go to Terminus DB uh, GitHub account, you will find our uh, Terminus DB uh, slash, uh, hyphen tutorials, then you would find all these um, scripts. Okay, cool. So Gavin is just doing a query then to find all the military conflicts and it's called Wackle dot or what is it called? Yeah, dot Yeah. There so we that go. That gives you an example. That gives you back a dictionary object. Since I limited it to ten, there's only ten objects uh, that are returned. And then we see that the first one is the Balearic Islands expedition. It returns it as a, a list of uh, of um, Python dictionaries, so that you can get in and and uh, modify those if you wanted to. Uh, to explore that object in more detail, you can just ask for the other elements of the triple um, as follows. And then that will, uh, that will give you all of the properties that it has. So for instance, we have a bunch of combatants that were involved in the uh, Balearic Island expedition. Uh, so these military conflicts are particularly of interest uh, they should also have information about the time. So the, the time is given here in the in the title, but it, there's also data points that describe the, the time. So if we you know, just to make it a little bit 100, we get a lot more information about that particular um, conflict. Then we can see um, uh, The, for the DVpedia case, there's going to have to be a little bit of exploration done. But you can see that uh, on the Balearic Island conflict, there is a value here of 113 to 115 Balearic Island expedition. Um, and it, it comes up a few times. Some of it will require a little bit of data cleaning. So mm. um, it might be useful to, to look at uh, our interface to regex in order to extract information from them. Uh, so you can, you can do a a regex on um, one of the outputs of these uh, in order to get some data about it. Uh, give me a second. Give it, get a... I've never heard of the Balearic expedition. Apparently, it was a crusade by the uh, by the by the by the Christians to knock the Muslims out of the Balearic Islands. Oh. Didn't know about that. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Just, uh... Okay. So, yeah, I I think if you join the uh, the Discord group, then uh, if you have questions using all this, that you could actually uh, ask questions. We will all be there to answer your questions. Um, so there are the JavaScript client and also the Python client available that you could both uh, do and, this uh, stuff. So how are we doing on time, Luke? Are we near, when? Well, we still have some more time. So if we want to flip back over to you to maybe look at some of those stuff. Yeah, I'll, I'll, just, I'll jump back in here, okay? Uh, Gavin, I'm, I'm gonna. Just because uh, it'd be good to kind of get into the, the yeah. belly of that a little bit. Okay, so, so actually what I'm showing here is, is the results in the console of, of the queries Gavin is doing. So this is the query that will get us all of the military conflicts and the data associated with them. Now, this is one of the problems with uh, DVpedia. 
there is differential use of of, uh, of actual property. So the dates that we have for conflicts, if you can see, those are, are, are we've got a hundred of them, but not everything has a date, and it's it's all of the dates uh, seem to be more modern. Uh, so so this is why this is very much an exploratory task. So if we put in here what Gavin was looking at, show me all of the properties that uh, military conflicts have. Okay, all of the properties of them uh, in, from DVPedia, we can see here, okay, we've got competence, okay? And it might be the case that actually the competence are more, are more associated with the date so that we can follow, okay, well, well, well just tell me, rather than telling me everything about uh, the military conflicts, let's see if, uh, if you just, I, I wanna say, okay, let me show, give me the comp competence uh, and see, uh, what they have recorded for competence in the, in the data set here. And so then we can see we've got, here's the list of competence, Arab Federation, it's India company uh, and various. Okay, so, so ver and then the next thing we're gonna say is, okay, well, well, do we have any dates associated with any of those competences? And so we can do a further exploration and say that triple and go into a new line to make it, it, it simple. Or, and we're saying, okay, well, I'm interested in, this, in what properties hang off this competence, the uh, property, uh, the value. Okay, and let's go. Whoops. Okay, so what happened there, did I spell it wrong? So these are all the prop are the competence. Okay, so the competent is not an IRI. It's actually just a word. So we're gonna have to then, like the Almoravids, we can probably guess at this stage that let's just bring up a new query page, investigate this. We're gonna say, okay, uh, um, we're gonna basically say V any, okay. Uh, and, and this is V property. And this, we're going to say, give me any property that is the value of a word of ads. This will probably be slow, Gavin, will it? Am I killing myself? Yeah, <laughs> yeah this is, because this is like a free text scan across all 65 million for, for this string. Okay, it didn't find it, why did it not find it? Am I, is there something wrong? Okay. Let's see, one more of it. Did I spell that wrong? Probably have to embed it in string. Yeah, let's see. Uh, is that it? I don't think so. No. I'm looking at the right. Uh, why is that not coming out? Uh. Let me just return to this. Why am I doing wrong? This is, I think this is just a very slow returning query that's gonna find me all the competence that are connected by a competent thing, I think. Yeah, that one looks like he's running slow. Okay, yeah, let me just return to that in a moment. Cause, uh, cause I, uh, we have, well, I'll figure out what's going on there in a moment. But uh, the thing I wanted to show really now is, uh, is in, into the social resilience data set and show some of its uh, schema related information. Uh, okay, so, so the, and, and kind of go through, I just want to kind of step through what we have to do uh, to create these type of models because the practicalities of, of like building a complicated data model and how you actually do it, uh, I think, you know, uh, these are very interesting, you know, these are, this is really what people find, uh, often find challenging. So I have a kind of step-by-step -step guide here, okay, that kind of goes through how we have constructed um, let me bring up, so what I'm going to do is, is just temporarily, I'm going to create a new branch uh, and this is going to be an empty branch and I'm going to use this branch to kind of step through the creation of a, uh, of the, of the ontology that we need for Peter's resilience data set. So I'm just going to uh, call this test because uh, it's just uh, for show, just to remind me that this is not the real data. 
And what I, get, what I do in here is, what I've done is, this is creating a meta model. So at the highest level, we want, we want to kind of have abstractions for organization polity, that, that's like a human grouping, but also things like sub polities, um, interest groups, settlements, cities, uh, and then we also have a, a particular type called uh, sided work, and these really are the um, these are the uh, uh, are what we'd call the meta models um, or the meta classes that give the overarching structure of, of how the different things fit together. So I'm just going to go in here and actually I need to I create a new empty branch. I need to create a schema first uh, before it'll actually uh, come on. Okay, and then what I need to do is I can go back and I can basically create all these classes like so. So if now I go back into my schema, I can see I've created classes, I've created classes called city, uh, called supercultural entities, polities, settlements, and so on. Uh, I've also, um, or, okay. So, so, and those are basically in, in the world of Terminus TV, documents are, are your highest level type of objects. They're the things that we're trying to create data around, about. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to do that is create a, a topic hierarchy. And this is like one of the big advantages of like of RDF and OWL and this whole world that we live in uh, is that you can have very easy uh, multiple inheritance. You can create different uh, type of class hierarchies and you can and you can have a specific document or a specific thing that inherits from multiple ones of those and that allows you to create kind of tree of life type type of taxonomies very easily uh, which enables you to organize your data much better to, to have all of the related type of uh, uh, type of data points organized in a particular way and so to do this in Terminus, we create our topics, uh, we create our, our, our top level topic is just called topic and we make it an abstract thing. And then we basically say, okay, here are all the topics that this data is related to, social complexity, politics, legal systems, work systems, food systems, rituals, finance, and so on. We just create a, a tree of, of topics and boom, uh, we now have added that to, to our system. Uh, and, and, the next thing that we're going to add is these are all the specific um, because be, in general it's a good idea for for any specific data set to try as much as possible to adopt meta models that have been defined by other people okay so so, so with Peter's resilience data set we're using the same model that Seshat uses to describe polities and organizations and settlements and their relationship to one another because that's already been defined. It's going to make it easier for us to integrate that data together uh, later. But we also have then all of the specific uh, areas that we're talking about in the resilience data. So we have, in terms of the data that Peter's tracking, some of it's to do with just variation, okay, in the abstract, but it's also like burial data, uh, agricultural diversity data. Uh, there, there's also dependent variables, specific variables that you're trying to track to see how they change with other variables. There's stuff to do with food storage, ceremonials, uh, how, how the housing and burials vary. Uh, there's stuff to do with a corporate exclusionary um, spectrum, like to what extent is a body or is it a society corporate or exclusionary, how loose or tight it is. Uh, how, where the authority emphasis, where the sharing of authority, how that is distributed, how the community is integrated, and aspects to do with leadership. So we can just create a, inside our model a hierarchy that describes all the concepts that we're interested in, and 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 add it uh, to our to our database. So this is really like building up a model, the model of the data that we need to capture in different layers. Uh, first of all, the, the meta layer, then the kind of topics. The next thing that, that's kind of important, and, and Peter kind of re referred to this uh, in terms of it's in terms of minimum infer inference possible is, is, a, is a high piece of desirability. So we want to, rather than, uh, we want to create what we call in computer science enumerated types. Uh, so so ver or, or properties that we are capturing that can have a, one of a set of types. So in this case, for every single data type, because we care so much about uncertainty and so on, we're going to basically add, uh, create, create a special class here called 
uh, that is called an enumerated type, first of all, uh, and then we're going to create an enumerated type of invariant, disputed, dubious, and uncertain that we can tag any of the data points with to give them a, to say, okay, here's a confidence value to associate with this data point. What we're also going to do here is, is we're going to create a stars property and the n property that allows us to add a, um, add a, a time scoping to every single data point in the data set. Yeah. We're, and finally, we're, we're going to create the properties for citations and quotations so that we can link every single data point in the data set with a specific citation and a specific quotation from that citation even. So, so this is like adding scoping uh, classes uh, to our schema. Okay, and we can run this query then. And that will do it, okay. And so these are, and so we can now go into a schema. We can actually look at this, you know, what the full schema looks like is an OWL document that we've just created. We've got, uh, these are all the different uh, topic classes and you can see they've, they're subclasses of other, like authority emphasis is, is defined by a sub is a politics variable and an internal affairs variable and a resilience variable. So by creating these type of, these topic hierarchies are, are hooks that we can kind of hang integrations and queries off. So give me all the resilience and re relevant data and so on. Uh, we can also see uh, some of our scoping classes that we've introduced in here. And we, you know, we, we've got classes to do with naval stuff. And, uh, this is all setting up the structure of our data to make, it, uh, to make it so that it'll be easy for us to both manage it and to do interesting queries across it. Um, so let me see here. Uh, so here is, a, th these are the kind of, uh, this end variable, it, it gives you an integer range actually. And again, because we're dealing in, in old historical time, the end, we want to be able to tag every single data point with saying, well, well this value was true, but it was, it was true in, within this range of dates and that range of dates is itself uncertain. So this gives us the, uh, the end of that range of dates could be a range itself. So, so this is basically building out the meta structure of, of the data model to allow us to capture all of that uncertainty and all of that type of information. And then the next thing we do is, as Peter said, a lot of the time you, you're trying to basically turn these variables into a small set of choices. So we have basically, we have frequency choices. Basically, we would just want to categorize things as rare, never frequent or unknown. We're trying to come in and come up with these meta categories and choices and embed these into our, our data model. So these are the available values for all of these. We have a whole bunch of areas that we want to capture one of a range of choices, like complexity choices. This is for, uh, this one here is for, this is for mapping uh, how much the social complexity has changed before and after a crisis. Uh, and, we, and we, to be able to kind of do that in a trans-historical way, you want to come up with quite broad and simple and inference light uh, uh, categorizations. So, so, so this is all the process that I, I'm kind of explaining uh, as to how we build a data model to, to capture, to enable us to capture the data, the historical data that we want. We borrowed like the meta model from Seshat. Uh, we've introduced a topic model we've introduced all the scopings we need, and then we've introduced all the, and then we introduce the properties we need to hang off them. And then we have a model that is set up for two things. It's set up that it's really easy to take all of that Seshat data and integrate it with, with Peter's data, because they're using the same meta model. Uh, and it's also, it's also, it's set up uh, so that what comes out has, has got a, a, or we're able to define the types of variables you want in, a, in as tight a way as possible that can be enforced by the computer system. So that when we start inputting data into it now, if, if, we, if we don't use the correct categories, it, the computer will complain at us and make us fix it, which is really what we want. We want our data model to help us, you know, uh, and tell us when we've made mistakes in integrating data in particular from, from third party sources. So, uh, so, uh, so we, uh, we, I also have, uh, and we will publish in the uh, hackathon group, we'll publish like all the scripts and examples uh, that I've shown here about kind of building out these data models uh, uh, and, uh, and also uh, querying, the, um, querying the various data resources that we have available here. 
one of the things like I'm showing everything here through the console. Uh, you can, uh, and you know, in the console, we have this view where we got a whole bunch of, of different databases that we can jump into and query. But Gavin's view uh, was showing you the view with the Python. You can actually query all the databases at once in the same query. So we can, you can actually do joins between the DBpedia data and the Seshet data and, the, and, and Peter's data all in the same query, okay? As, as we kind of shown, the difficult thing is exploring the data and finding, finding which is a reliable date in this data set that I, or a reliable region or the reliable name of a place or a, a reliable name of a battle that I can use as a key uh, to join these two data sets together. Okay, so any questions arising out of that? Thanks, Kevin. That uh, was very interesting. And I think there's kind of a lot to take on board there. Yeah. Uh, so I think, um, you know, uh, probably the best way to do it the, in terms of the hackathon is to take it to the, the you know, a collaborative session tomorrow. Very yeah. interesting whereby we can kind of, you know, work out exactly what we hope to achieve within the time period. Uh, I think Dimitri's on the call as well. Dimitri's going to kind of try and uh, put some shape on that about how we you know, what we can hope to achieve and what questions we can hope to answer collectively through the period of the, um, of the hackathon and really give people some challenges that they can go away with um, and things that people can kind of try and get their teeth into in a, in a, in a relatively um, achievable and collective way. And I think, you know, uh, Peter had brought up a couple of possibilities of the types of questions that we might want to try and ask um, an answer which is using the social resilience cases uh, which which you were looking at there identify episodes of famine or and or epidemic disease in the 50 year period following 535 the common era with estimates of deaths where possible and using the social resilience cases identify military conflicts in the period between 500 and 600 with estimates of the number of combatants and the number of deaths where possible so really trying to draw from DBpedia um, a whole range of information that will enrich that, that social resilience um, uh, use case or social resilience uh, data, data set. And so I think like we kind of try and explore how interesting that'll be and how um, difficult it'll be uh, tomorrow during the, the session in, in, the, uh, in the Slack or in the, in the, in the yeah. um, Discord channel. So does that make sense? I mean, I, Peter, do you have any um, additional comments at this point? Okay, great. Um, so, uh, so that was very interesting. And I think there's a lot of information, stuff to take away there. Yeah. Final sign off comments, uh, Kevin and Gavin. Well, well, you know, this is, it's also important to remember that this is kind of ongoing uh, and, you know, ever growing work. Like we are uh, in constant uh, efforts to try and, you know, improve and add data to these data sets and anything that we can find here, uh, we're going to then feed back into like a, a common resource, like all of this information, like uh, we have all of the data that we're showing you, we, we are making that available. Anybody comes up with something good, we will incorporate that and, and make a better data set. Like at this stage, you know, this technology is still kind of new, particularly the branching and the merging and the collaboration features. So, so, but already we are starting to kind of, it's, it's incredibly useful because we can, you know, do these type of things and share the data very readily with other people. And that's really what we want to see, you know, we want to see, it's not like there's one great data set that we're building. We want to build, you know, uh, infrastructure of interesting data resources, along with, you know, here's a guide as to how you can take some of the data out of this and integrate it with this other information. And, and you know, but would also make those uh, integrated data sets available to people. Like uh, for us, you know, that's really important. Uh, and, you know, any, any contributions to the, the hackathon, anybody comes up with something good, it'll be immediately incorporated into, into people's analysis and stuff like that. You know, people, uh, we are hungry for, for information, you know, that we can plug into like uh, Peter's analysis, other analysis, uh, and, you know, the, the, and these are really quite socially significant things as well, you know. Mm. And so, 
And so like digging, you know, information about the sixth century conflicts and, and you know, and what polities were around and anything to do with them from DVpedia uh, is, it, as I say, these things, because you're dealing with all of the data integration problems, they can be challenging. You often have to chase down, uh, you know, uh, chase down uh, various branches to find the, the days you're interested in. But if you do so, then we can, we have the facility to incorporate that data into a, like an ongoing archive, an ongoing artifact that is, is valuable and useful. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. And I think people that are interested in these data sets, they can come along, they can fork them, they can mess around with them. You have that ability to kind of take it away, work on it yourself, then yeah. try and resync it back in with the main line. Yeah. It just gives people a lot of flexibility in how they might work with it. And there's lots of cool applications that can be built on the back of these sorts of um, historical databases as well. There's lots of yeah. analytics and other sorts of stuff that I can see being usefully built on the back of these sorts of uh, yeah. scale yeah. historical data sets from the, the deep and the meaningful to the super trivial as well, you know? Give me, you know, kick me out like the name of uh, you know, a Roman emperor or something like that every day, or, you know, all sorts of interesting stuff. <laughs> Twitter bot or a Discord bot, or whatever it might be. Because, um, you yeah. know, I, I look at that one that pulls out the names of the, um, the day according to the French Republican calendar and posts on Twitter every day. And I think, you know, that's a, a great application of some of our historical data sets as well. <laughs> Uh, just, you know, uh, Gavin, do you have anything to add? I see that Gavin has been populating not only the chat here, but also the Discord group uh, with all of those queries so that if people are looking to replicate the work that took place in this working session, they can go away and immediately do so. You know, download the Terminus DB and connect to Hub and quickly clone the databases. Even though DVPD is quite large, it's um, you know, over 600 uh, megs in the compressed format that we provided. It only takes a couple of minutes for you to get up and running um, and querying the database and really digging into the data. So uh, there's lots of opportunity in those queries for people to kind of get started and get interested in which, which direction you want to go with the data. Um, and then tomorrow we're going to get together uh, at noon Irish time um, yeah. and see which way we can go with some of the broader questions around the query. And the Terminus DB team is going to be working in the hackathon as well. And um, so we're going to be trying to kind of, you know, move our work forward as well on all of this historical data analysis, historical data cleaning. So it'll be great to see some people get involved. Gavin, you have anything to add there? You were no, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions people have about, uh, you know, technically how to, how to get any of these queries to happen and, uh, you know, yeah. ways of uh, getting jumped in. So I'm, I'm exactly. And as you can see, it's a kind of, you know, it's it, with these, especially with DVpedia, when you're not clear exactly what's in there, you've got to do a little bit of trial and error to a see. A bit of digging. Yeah, where it's right. going to work and a little bit of cleaning along the way to make sure that you're kind of getting to the data that is available uh, within the, the DVpedia and I think I, I was looking at the DVpedia Slack earlier on, and they also have some data cleaning projects internally for how they're trying to enrich and upgrade their their, their data. And so we're kind of involved in that too. That's right. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, there, there's also the possibility, of course, of feeding this data back into uh, DVpedia as well. You know, they're also yeah. DVpedia also always wants you know high quality structured data going back in. So. So that's, yeah. you, know, uh, it, uh, you know, the reality is everybody wants uh, uh, integration with other data sets. You know, this is the most difficult thing. And uh, it's difficult because of the, you know, the, the differences in models and so on. But anything we can do in these type of publicly available data sets can feed in all directions, really, you know. And, yeah. and, and coming up with, uh, with queries that work, you know, that, that just work and say, well, here's a query that will... There, there's always a bit of effort in crafting that query, but this guy will get me the useful stuff in this area. They're gold dust, you know, because you can just run them over and over and keep on extracting data and build, you know, a valuable integrated data source that, that refreshes itself. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, as I say, the, the effort in a lot of this is really working out 
okay, here are the properties that I have to check to, you know, get a date or get, get a location that allows me to do the matching. But once you do that, it's automatable. And then, you know, you, you can have a thing that's, that's integrated forever, which is, you know, and that's the, the huge value in these type of integrations of open data sets. If you can do it in such a way that you can just basically say, oh, suck all of that new information as it comes out of, uh, out of Wikipedia and as people put it in, then, you know, th that has a much, much greater value than, a, you know, a single point-to-point -point integration, which you might do, you know, if, for a specific uh, publication. Uh, you, uh, doing it this way, you, you get you get that val you get the ability to kind of run it over and over again. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right, and that's exactly what the goal is of Terminus Hub is to provide those sorts of data sets so that people can just yeah. in, in one go and it'll enrich your analysis as you go. Um, I think for for people that are interested in in the broader um, uh, theoretical point, there's a good video over on our YouTube channel of Kevin giving our team a, an introduction to um, structural uh, demographic theory um, and discussing some of the kind of, you know, the leading lights of that and some of the interesting points there. So anybody that's interested in checking that out, we have these uh, discussion sessions on Fridays where we just talk about different issues that we're interested in. So if people want to check that out, please do and um, have a look at, at what's going on there. Apart from that, if there's no other points, if there's nothing in, no other comments or, or questions, we'll, we'll leave it there. It was a great 90 minutes, and thanks a lot, Peter and Kevin and Gavin, for all the efforts over, over the 90 minutes. I think it was a really useful and valuable introduction, um, and let's hope for something great to come out of this hackathon. And the only last point I'd make is that, you know, if you're interested in doing something different with Terminus Hub, Terminus DB, and the DBpedia database or DBP data, feel free to go for it. Um, don't feel constrained by uh, any of the things that we say. If you want to build something really cool, do it. Um, and, you know, you'll win the first prize in our hackathon, which is, uh, you know, a very generous 500 euros. And then for every, all other participants, you'll get one of these uh, wonderful tubes that Peter uh, introduced us to uh, with a whole bunch of Terminus DB swag to go on top. Um, so, yeah, please, uh, please get involved and we'll see anybody that's interested tomorrow. Fantastic. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks Cheers. very much. See yeah. you guys. Bye.